So Seda Grossos is here to talk about, uh, give us a critical overview of the past decade of privacy enhancing research. Um, please give her a warm round of applause of welcome. Thank you. And thank you for getting up and coming here. Uh, it was hard for me, so I'm assuming it was just as hard for you. Um, I will come from an academic perspective, which can actually induce sleep, in which case please use the shoulder to your left or right, if whichever is available. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about what, has, what I will call privacy research within computer science. I'm a computer scientist, specifically a requirements engineer. Um, a lot of my work is on privacy and security requirements, um, engineering. Uh, anyway, so there's a lot of research that's been going on on privacy, and what I would like to do is open up a discussion and hope that it will be a robust discussion so we don't, you know, try to protect what we do but have a critical take at it with the intention to improve it. Um, am I sometimes losing the voice? Because, yeah, I am, huh? All right, so, um, so what I'll try to do is look at a number of privacy technologies or solutions and see where their successes are and where their failures are. I'll try to go through them with you. In order to do that, I will look at some of the assumptions, some of the implicit and explicit assumptions, what the researchers aspire to do, some of the limitations of the technologies, and I will also count some future steps. I will talk about research, but some of the solutions and technologies I talk about you might have been involved in, activists have been involved in, um, TOR is an example. I'm not trying to in any way in exclude people who have been participating. I'm just taking the research perspective and I'm relying on the researcher's perspective. Okay. But before I go on, I have to make a few distinctions in terms of vocabulary. So I first make a distinction between privacy and data protection. This distinction I'm taking from Serge Gutwert, who is also from Belgium. And basically, um, Gutwert and De Hert in their paper say, privacy is actually a rather vague notion. And this vagueness is part of its protective attributes. So because it's vague, because we don't know exactly what is privacy and what counts as a privacy breach, it's kind of like a flag you can put up if you have some problems which you would like to attribute to a privacy problem. Right, so the vagueness of the definition of privacy becomes part of its protectiveness. So you don't have a list of things that are privacy or privacy breaches. Instead, it's an open um, notion that you can pick up when you need it. Kind of like freedom in that sense. So it's non-absolute. It's very much dependent on the context what privacy means. It's relational. depends on what other elements are there legally and socially and technically and economically. And most important of all, it's about the opacity of the individual. So you want to somehow give the individual a sort of protection, um, a sort of opacity. Data protection, on the other hand, is a set of procedural safeguards. It's about making people who collect, or mostly organizations who collect data, accountable for their data practices. And in order to do that, it requires them to be transparent about the data protect practices that they uh, employ. So in that sense, data protection is a transparency tool. And I hope that now I've made clear that these are very, two, very different notions. Data protection may not always be about protecting your privacy. It's also important to um, note that when I talk about data protection, I'm talking about the EU directive. And there are two main objectives of the EU directive. One is to protect data. The other one is to make sure that it flows. So it's not about keeping the data protected. It's about making sure that within a, within countries who comply with data protection, information can flow freely. It's economic incentive as well. An important element of data protection is that it focuses on what is called personal data. And personal data is anything that can be somehow linked to an individual. So in both cases, the focus is on the individual. And here I would like to move on to yet another concept, which I will call surveillance. I'm sure you've heard of the panopticon. So the idea is that you have a tower in the middle, um, it was a, spoken about by Foucault, uh, it's an architectural concept for prisons, so you have a tower in which the guard um, observes the prisoners, um, and the idea is that the prisoners cannot see if they're being observed, and that way they have this concept, they have this feeling or perception that they're being observed all the time and start controlling themselves. Um, I'm going to talk about a very specific definition of surveillance, which is you collect information about a population, you collate and analyze that information that you collect, 
you do a statistical analysis, and then you decide who you're going to discriminate in that population. So you look for those who fit your norms or who fit the general norms, you look for those who do not, and you decide how you're going to treat them. A simple way to call this is also called social sorting. This theory I'm picking from a bunch of researchers called surveillance studies researchers. They're actually in a, sense, in a sort of parallel universe, um, universe to privacy researchers, and I highly recommend reading their material. Um, so what is important about the surveillance definition I'm using is that this kind of surveillance goes hand in hand with the modern state. So I'm not making a moral judgment value about the surveillance systems. I'm just saying, if you want to have a modern state which has you know, the citizens and offers some services to the citizens, then you're going to have to start counting those citizens. That means you're going to count your beans. That means you're going to start surveilling. Okay, so it kind of goes hand in hand the systems in most, with most of the systems we live in. Now, this is not the only model of surveillance of the panopticon I gave because it's recognizable. There are others, like there's surveillance, I'm not going to describe these. There's data valence, there's covalence, and recently I heard in Germany somebody's been talking about sauna valence. Um, I think some Jarvis and post privacy is in the topic. Anyways, I'm just going to talk about surveillance, okay? Population data, statistical analysis, and social sorting. So what I've done within computer science is to look at all the research that is done with the title privacy. Um, I will not summarize every one of them, but what I did find out when I looked at these papers is that they rely on very different assumptions and have different objectives. And I wanted to distinguish these, so I decided that I found, I mean, these might change with time, um, three different privacy research paradigms. Now, when I talk about a research paradigm, I'm talking about the implicit assumptions that researchers use to do their research. So you need to have a set of assumptions that you work with so that you can improve your research, right? And what are these? So the most um, dominant paradigm that I find in privacy is privacy is confidentiality. So the definition of privacy that the people who work on privacy is confidentiality take is the right to be al let alone, as defined by Warren and Brandeis in 1890. And the basic principles that the solutions proposed by these researchers try to achieve is to hide information. Because the idea is, if you can keep your data to yourself, if you can keep your information to yourself, you have your privacy. If you reveal it, you lost it, your privacy is gone. So if you have your data, you have your privacy. If you reveal it or if it's leaked, you don't have your privacy, it's lost. So basic idea is to either hide this information or data or hide identity, so make it unlinkable to yourself. And the second paradigm, um, I will call the privacy as control. This is the more popular one that you see economically. Um, also, it, businesses like this definition. Um, it depends on this other definition of privacy, which is the right of the individual to decide what information about himself should be communicated to others and under what circumstances. That's from Western 1970. Um, some of the principles that the researchers try to achieve in this kind of research is separation of identity. So I have a number of digital identities. You can also call them data bodies. Um, and you maybe want to separate your audiences and you want to have some sort of control over what happens with the data once you've revealed it. So this idea in the privacy is confidentiality, which is that as soon as you reveal data, the control is gone, is actually reversed. Instead, once you reveal, you're allowed to have some sort of control. And somehow you try to do that technically, but you also have to rely on the transparency tool I talked about earlier, data protection. So those two things go hand in hand. So if you don't believe in legal mechanisms, you're probably not going to go with this paradigm. The last paradigm, which is rather less known, is what I call privacy as practice. And it depends on the definition, on different definitions, but the one I select here is the freedom from unreasonable constraints on the, constru on the construction of one's own identity from AGRI 1999. Um, I would also put Hildebrand's um, arguments on here where she says, we're not born with a specific identity. It's constantly in development as soon as we come and start interacting with our environment and with other people. And privacy is being able to do that, exactly. So it's very much about the collective experience we have with our data, with privacy, with transparency. So a lot of the solutions in this um, paradigm are about giving users information and feedback about what happens with their data or the data of the people that they're kind of collated with in the population, right? So transparency tools. Okay. Um, the basic argument I'd like to make is that none of these paradigms are the right paradigm or the wrong paradigm, and they actually work together really well. Um, 
and they also have similar failures on some level. So we'll talk about that now. Let's start with privacy's confidentiality. Um, just very short hist history. Um, a lot of the people who think privacy is confidentiality, so if your data is confidential, you have your privacy. If it's not confidential, you lost your privacy. So that paradigm actually comes a lot from security engineering, which comes a lot from military um, people in the past. Okay. So starting with 69, the first discussions in the U.S. about creating centralized databases about citizens, um, politicians walk over to computer scientists, computer scientists or, or mostly security engineers are informed about this privacy problem and they say, well, that reminds us of a confidentiality problem, so privacy is confidentiality. So there's really this moment of stepping saying privacy is this, so this translation work that's being done. Um, you know, 70s, I think it's much more about access control. How do you actually manage access control in systems? 80s, you see, start seeing really interesting developments. So you have Chalm's proposal for anonymous communications. Um, so the idea, a lot of you probably know, is about keeping the confidentiality of uh, the content of communication and who's communicating, who's communicating with whom. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so, and um, the Andreas Fitzmann, who we lost, unfortunately, this year, Brigitte Fitzmann and Michael Weidner, and a few other people were in that community back then, so a very small community. Mid-80s, John makes proposals for blind signatures. He's starting to build, he's trying to kind of develop these fun tricks where you're getting things which are usually seen as contradictory, so anonymity and authenticity is what he's going for in blind signatures. Um, 90s, um, Trom develops a scheme for anonymous cash. They actually had a company and they tried to introduce e anonymous e-cash. Um, the project failed, maybe a little bit too early for its time. Um, Brands then develops a scheme for single show selective disclosure credentials. So you have a credential and you don't show all the information that you have on that credential, but just parts of it. And you prove that the stuff on, on that um, credential is true. Um, Kamenish and the Sianskaya have then developed what are called multiple show selective disclosure credentials. So once you have a credential with a set of information, um, you can show different parts of it multiple times. That's basically the intuition you should have. The main idea with all these developments is that you want to minimize the data revealed during authentication authorization. So you want something with authentication um, and you want to prove certain things and make sure that you don't show anything else other than what you're proving, and this I will describe shortly as zero knowledge proofs. Okay. So in the 2000s, a lot of researchers joined this community. Um, a lot of different workshops and conferences started, um, and hundreds of people are now working on these topics, and I will talk a little bit about the results. So just a real short introduction to anonymizers. So the point of an anonymizer is that you have two sets of people um, who are communicating, let's call them the anonymity set, um, and any observer cannot distinguish who in one anonymity set is communicating with the other. You can have different properties. It could be that the people you're communicating with don't know who you are. In other cases, it's just a relationship that is being hidden. So the model that the anonymizers rely on um, is that there's an adversary who does not know who's communicating with whom, but is able to make probabilistic models which means that you need to start thinking about mathematically modeling how strong your anonymity scheme is. In order to do that, you use metrics, um, mathematical metrics. Um, these are usually entropy-based metrics. And then comes the most important question that comes up again and again in privacy solutions, which means you need to decide how strong anonymity should be in order to provide the right kind of privacy in the real world. There is no answer to this question. It's not just a research question, it's an application question. We also have no procedure for deciding the strength of anonymity. The most important thing you should remember from anonymizers is the fact that when you use an anonymizer, or when a user uses an anonymizer, the user's traces are delinked from that identity. So what you leave behind cannot be linked back to you. Another um, set of solutions have been provided not by security engineers but data, data miners. Data miners had a much more economic, economic approach to privacy. So their question was how can I use data without infringing upon the rights of individuals? And specifically what they meant with that is how can I do analysis on data without uniquely identifying who is in that data set? Um, this is sometimes very important. You can imagine in a hospital, you want to have some sort of transparency, right? You want to know how many of the people who visited that hospital died, for example. <laughs> and you want to make the 